don't. Don't open that box. What have you done? You shouldn't have opened it. You shouldn't have opened it. Open it. Open it. Open it. Hello, listening people. Hello. You're listening to Spit and Polish Presents The Mystery Box. I am one of your hosts, Ryan Swinski. And I'm the other one, Bartek. And we are Spit and Polish, likingly because we are always spitting and we both happen to be Polish. Is that not correct, Bartek? I believe so. That is th- that is the setup, and that's the payoff. I set it up by saying we're Spit and Polish, and you're thinking, oh, Polish, what's, like... They're polishing off some cutlery, and then the payoff is no. It's the word. Po- it's actually Polish because of our uh, heritage, lineage, and culture. There you go. I know. So we are presenting to you our monthly show, the Mystery Box. What's the Mystery Box? You ask. Great question. On our show, the Mystery Box, we have a literal box that is full of mysterious items, DVDs, mm-hmm. or that are movies or video projects or question mark, question mark, question mark. We don't know. We know that they are discs, at least. They are discs. I would love it if I opened up one of them and there were just it was just nothing but sand in there. <laughs> <laughs> Someone donated sand because I find these, or we find these uh, DVDs, these videos, these things second hand from op shops from cash converters the gutter i don't know just from random mysterious locations and i love the idea that someone else owned this before i or bartek got it yeah someone owned this and they thought "Mm, i want to give this away yeah and at some point in the process of you know putting it in these stores and us getting it, it gets put in that mysterious crypt that you heard in the opening. Exactly. It's put in there and then one of us, we dared to open it and we shouldn't have, but here we are having to discuss what's in the box. But we don't always do it alone, do we, Bartek? We don't always discuss what's in the box by ourselves. Nope. Only done that once before, Ryan. And it was pretty fun. Yeah, it was. Had a fun time with that. Yeah. But for this episode, it's not just us. We are joined by a guest... Jesus. It's Jesus Christ himself. Lachlan Redfern. Hello, Lachlan. Hello, Ryan. Good to be back. It's always great to have you. We haven't had you on a Mystery Box podcast before, but it is a pleasure to have you on. So now here's the thing, guys. What movie did you watch for the Mystery Box, you're asking? (laughs) What was the movie? I can't read the title of the episode. I'm blind. And they don't allow Braille on a touch screen. So what's the movie that you guys watch for the mystery box? Well, what's the movie that the guest had to choose at random from the box? Well, closing my eyes and picking one at random, we ended up with Adventures of Roborex. Yes. James, I sent Roborex here to assist you with anything you need. You mean he's like Rex? <laughs> he is Rex from the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah! Run, James. Uh, I found Roborex. I found it not at an op shop. I did not find this at a cash convenience. I found this at a post office. Oh. I went to the post office. When I, when I opened the box, it said, like, Blockbuster or something. Like, oh, it must be, like, an ex-rental. It's an ex-rental that was then given to a post office that I was at sending mail. And literally, I bought three or four DVDs that day from that post post office. I found this at a post office, and it was sitting in the DVD rack outside the post office. Mm. Like, there's a, little, there's a rack of, like, books and DVDs So outside. something was getting stolen. It would be... And it was the one sitting up front, and I saw this crazy DVD. And this is where we have to get into the cover of of the DVD. Now, Bartek, could you give us 
uh, a description of this wonderful cover, and I think you could understand why it caught my eye. Well, Ryan, um, as we know, DVDs have that nice uh, portrait rectangular style to them. Yes. Some might call it a shape. On this cover... On previous episodes, we've had, like, a lot of little things on there. Like, in Deep Rescue, you know, like, there was a plane in the upper right and a ladder in the bottom right. Yeah, yeah, a spaceship, yeah. And, like, certain characters spread throughout, but they're kind of small. This cover, like, yeah, there's text on there, but the thing that sticks out the most... Oh, yeah. ...is a gigantic robot dog. A huge robot dog. Like, it is ludicrously large. I'll say this. The setting of this cover is, of like, a... It almost looks like the deep uh, hallway from the Deep Rescue rocket ship. It looks like it's in some kind of s- rocket ship, spaceship, and it's blue. Yeah. Like, it's it's lit blue, which is... I mean, I don't want to spoil nothing too hard, but I will. The whole movie's blue. The whole movie's got this bluish tint, and we never see this specific rocket ship corridor. But I guess the cover isn't lying that it's saying blue... So, you yeah, know. So it, it looks like a hallway between rooms on a, on a spaceship of some sort. And this robot dog is like maybe a few inches away from its head being on the ceiling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's so big. And of course, you got the funky Robo horse. It's basic. It is the size it's it's the size of a horse. Now, it's got some really cool text, though, doesn't it? The font is pretty amazing on this. Yeah, like, at the top, they've got Adventures of in smaller white font, Adventures is all caps. But then Roborex is a nice, big red with, like, a white line, like, kind of through, a gleam through, through the upper You corner. know what it is? Do you remember when you were a young kid? Are you going to bring up clip art or word art? Or yes. <laughs> yeah. You remember when you were a young kid and computers were new to you or yeah. new to the world and they had, like word and clip art and you were playing around with making font 3d and you would like spin it around and you play with all the different color options and gradient options that's what this looks like <laughs> that's this cover look at it that's that's this cover it's so, like when you were a five-year-old kid playing with clip art yep and then of course it's not just robo rex that's no, no. the robo rex giant... is the big thing that stands out there is another character just to be clear, Roborex is a character in the Adventures of. That was my. I'm a DJ. Yes, behind him, you can see just above his back is the antagonist of the film, mm. whose name escapes me. On Doctor Apocalypse, Ethan, Ethan Phillips. Yeah, Ethan Phillips, the he, actor. Yeah, it's to get not to get too much into the film. He's got an older version of himself who is called Doctor Apocalypse, and this is his past version. Yes, there this... is time travel in this. And, and don't worry, Star Trek Voyager fans, it is Neelix. Just so you know, you know, like is that is that another Ethan Phillips? No, it's him. It's Neelix. Your voice says go away, but your heart wants me to make you smile. Please, go away. Come on, a little smile. How is it going to hurt? I won't tell anyone. What must I do to convince you to stop? Come on, just a little itty bitty smile. Just let the mouth curl a little there. <laughs> That's you know, there's an old Talaxian song my mother used to sing me as a child. I'm going to sing it to you every day from now on. It goes... <laughs> Sorry, I, I... Uh, there's a tagline. Man's best friend just got an upgrade. And that's that's it. That's the cover. And you can see why it caught my eye. It's very, very audacious and very in your face. Well, Ryan, I thought the thing that would catch you is that it's a PG-rated film with mild themes and violence. I remember the themes. They were pretty mild. Now, Bartek... Since you're already on the describe... The violence, however, not really so mild when it happens. Uh, no, it's pretty full on. So, Bartek. Yes? When you saw that Lachlan had picked the adventures of Robo Rex, what were you expecting? Well, I I did notice that it's called Adventures of Robo Rex, so part of me was thinking, okay, some things that tend to start with adventures... Maybe, like, TV shows, like Adventures of Jimmy Neutron to separate it from the Jimmy Neutron film. Mm. Adventures um, of Lena and Whitley. 
no yeah. movie yet. But no movie yet. But nothing else on the cover seemed to indicate that it was a TV show. So I was expecting, you know, maybe maybe this is actually a film. <laughs> yeah. Um it looks like a legitimate DVD cover. It's It's got a lot of potential. And I was expecting, we are going to have fun with this. It's going to be a little bit cheesy, I reckon. Yeah. We, we'll get some laughs. It's very clearly a kid's film. Yes. So, I found the DVD. And, of course, I had a little bit of time to think about what this was going to be about when looking at this cover. And I, I was immediately drawn to the giant robot dog. And I thought, oh, there's going to be a giant robot dog in this. It's going to be huge. They're going to ride this dog. And I see this crazy scientist guy behind him. And for some reason, my brain never connected that he could be the bad guy. I thought this is the dog's owner. Well, I think, I I think thought, one thing... I thought thing... that the sign ma- he, clearly evil scientist character I, was I, going to yeah. be the main character of the I movie. I immediately thought that guy's evil. I did not connect it to my brain. I saw him and just went, oh, is the whole movie going to be about this? This is what I thought. The whole movie is going to be about he invents this giant robot dog and it runs away and he has to try and catch it throughout the movie. That's what I thought the I movie thought was going to be about. I thought it was going to be Baby's Day Out, but with a robot dog. I thought it was going to be something like that, only it's just he discovers a pack of children and they teach him the true meaning of love. Let's get into the meat and potatoes. The meal. The movie itself. Because we had our expectations, we had our ideas, but the movie said, Hey, listen up. Here's a DVD menu. Here's the menu, and it only has the feature option and the trailer option. Which are you going to pick? No no subtitles or audio options. So if you're, if you're deaf, you can't watch this movie on DVD. So just, just so you know. I thought the dog was going to be big... The dog's not big in this movie. Yeah, you're st- <laughs> I was... Are we not going through this chronologically? I just have to say this straight off the bat. We will, but I have to say I... straight off the bat, the dog's not big. It's I... smaller well, than medium, the actual... Medium, surely. It's smaller than the actual dog that is in the movie. Up the, to, uh, up the, to the, a... Per- the organic dog that we called Flesh Rex. So I never thought the dog was big. I thought it was just perspective. Because you've got to make the main character look big on your movie cover. Yeah, but this is... Well, that's why ludicrously I... big, and his shadow underneath him is ludicrously big. And that's why. I that's thought, why oh. I pointed out that his head's almost at the ceiling. Yes. Yeah. So. Well it's, well, it's perspective, really. I think. I think it's just bad Photoshop. <laughs> I think they didn't think about this very much at all. But I just want you to know the dog's not big. It's in fact incredibly small. Uh, but let's go into this chronologically now. Do we remember how the movie opened? I remember there was narration. There was narration from a young boy character whose name was boy character? James? Young. Sure, why not? Well, there, James. Was, there was text laid in the film that said James, remember? James. So. <laughs> Look, don't blame me for not remembering an, another young boy character from a movie. There's just so many of them. I can't remember Jimmy's name. There is a force... The most powerful force in all the universe that can be used for great good or incredible evil. And that force is what, the dog or? James? It was the pendant (laughs) made out of glass around his head. (laughs) That his mum left him once she died or travelled somewhere else? This new mysterious, mysterious element that turned out to provide almost unlimited power. I spent the movie hoping it was going to be uranium. I did too, but so we do get set up with that. That's the beginning of the movie, this narration about like, my mum gave me this shitty necklace that's actually the most powerful thing in the universe and the MacGuffin of the movie. I think he said that verbatim, yes. (laughs) Play the audio, right? In editing. (laughs) And then it's just my voice with a higher pitch. (laughs) My mum gave me this shitty necklace that's actually the most powerful thing in the universe and the MacGuffin of the movie. Yeah, good memory, Lachlan, because what I remember Thank was you. I forgot the I forgot the narration in anything he said because he had this ludicrous Rube Goldberg machine to wake him up that put Henry in the Book of Henry to shame. It just I remember Bartek turning over to me and saying, "If this is this going to be the whole movie?" <laughs> just, that, well, that was the a whole, joke. The whole Rube Go- the whole Rube. I, Goldberg it was a very machine. long one. I'm just wondering when Rube Goldberg waking up device became a movie cliche. Uh I think Avenge. I think Robo Rex. Right, <laughs> it has to be because like, like a Wallace and Gromit did it, and everyone else had to. I was just like a 
first five minutes of the movie, I was wondering if this was going to turn out to be a darker and edgier Wallace and Gromit. Yes, I would. L- oh, yeah. I and in a way, that. it kind of was complete it was with an evil robot pet. And uh, this Rube Goldberg machine, obviously, the appeal of this is that you see everything how everything fits together. No. No, it just no? It just cuts to random shit being hit after random yeah, shit. Yeah, I said that, that too. You, you just you don't see how it flows into one another, and then yeah. and then yeah. it cuts, and then yeah. the the credits are there. Okay, well, since it's cutting, that means it's a very short sequence, right? No, no, it's incredibly long and tedious. But I love they could have they could have just filmed a bunch of random stuff happening and put okay, let's edit this in rapid succession. People will think it's one big machine. Exactly. You know what I loved? I, I think you guys focus on that a little bit more. But I love they tried to do that thing that that certain movies and TV shows do, like the movie Moon or uh, the TV show Sherlock, in which they have the text of the movies, titles, and actors be a part of the movie you know where it's like the text has a shadow on something and mm-hmm. and the mach- like something from the machine grabs it and drops it somewhere else and it hits something like it tried to do that but it didn't know how to do and again this goes back to the cover it didn't know how to do perspective for the font in the actual image of wherever the font was so it just looked incredibly terrible so uh, this Rube Goldberg machine's flying around and it's there to just basically wake up this kid and his dog who is incredibly depressed. And what's the ultimate thing that wakes him? Oh, a water balloon. Was it like an alarm or something? No, no, a water balloon drops on his fucking face. <laughs> After he ignored the first part of the wake up machine, oh. knowing that the water balloon was going to come. And his dad saying, get out of bed. So he had like two things there. And, and, and the dog barking the too. The best part of the machine <laughs> was that they hit, after the water balloon, it's like you saw that they, the machine had five backup water balloons. Yeah, yeah, because he's ready. He's ready for this in case he sleeps like, through it again. He needed, like, what prior experience made him realize he needed six water balloons to wake him oh, up? Oh, I'll tell you. The kid's mum's dead, so, you know, the family is dealing with the death of the mum, so this family, including the dog, is very depressed. So they might need several water balloons to the face to wake up every morning, including the dad, who is a policeman. Don't worry. Were you wondering, is this movie where the kid's a precocious child genius with a Rube Goldberg machine and a depressed dog? Were you wondering, is his dad a policeman? He is, of course he is. They always are in these movies. He's got the badge on one side and the word police on the other. On exactly. Face. And then dad embroidered on his collar. Now, right, you <laughs> said you said that the kid is precocious. Yeah. Oh, because yeah. obviously yeah. the film starts off with narration and then his Rube Goldberg machine. And then I believe the next shot shows him with this Helmet. Helmet. Helmet that is automatically brushing his, his teeth. teeth. But it's not even hitting his mouth, probably it's hitting like his upper lip. But I remember, I think it was you, Lachlan, who said, like, uh, this kid looks incredibly grumpy. Uh, when he when he was there, and I said like, oh well, it's because this is like the fifteenth take, and the toothbrush is cutting his upper lip at this point. I don't remember saying it was grumpy, but I, I, I do. I did love the part of a scene where it's like, I I love the father coming in and saying like. You, you know that takes twice as long as actually brushing your teeth, right? First shot, oh, well, first bit, you see the Rube Goldberg machine. Yep. Second shot, you see the teeth brushing thing. Yep. Calling him precocious, inventions. Throughout the whole film, he's going to have a bunch of inventions to show off, right? No. No, 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 no of course not. That would be stupid. Okay, but he's got at least one more, right? No. No? Well, no. He, he does have one. Like, what, possibly my, my favourite moment of the movie is just that, like, um... He's just sort of working on something at his desk. The dog barks at him and tries to get his attention. That doesn't work. The dog bark. The dog sort of uh, bats this um little little dog. Oh, like yeah, the, yeah, the like the bell, bell. A, a bell that he placed that the kid placed on the floor specifically so the dog. D- can get his attention. No, he still ignores that. Does the does the bell have a little? Bell. Does the bell have a little sign next to it so you yep. know what it's there for? Yep. What, what was the sign? What Please the ring sign for, for service. <laughs> like he specifically creates this sort of like bell system so the dog can get his attention, and he still ignores him. We've got to let you know. There's two dogs in this movie. There's a normal dog called Rex, who's just a normal yellow, organic dog, yellow Labrador. And then there's a dog later called Robo Rex, 
who's a robot dog, okay? I don't want you to get confused. So when we refer to dog, it will be just be normal dog, and robot dog will be robo dog or robo rex or robot dog. But while we were watching the film, I immediately called the non-robot dog Flesh Rex. Flesh Rex. <laughs> we just, it stuck. We go about the normal thing. He wakes up. We get introduced to this idea when he's being driven to school that the mum's passed away, the dad's kind of focused on the work of being a policeman, and the kid doesn't really have any friends. He's being driven to school, Ryan? Yeah. But doesn't he take the bus? No, he misses the bus because he was too busy brushing his teeth. And playing with the dog. Oh, that's right. After ignoring oh, him. Oh, how? Oh, yeah, that's one of the funniest scenes in the movie. He's eating breakfast by himself, and the dog looks so depressed. This dog Rex is. I've never seen a dog look suicidal before, but this dog. Every shot, every single shot of this dog, he's so depressed. Lachlan said at one point, what did they do to the dog to make him this depressed? And I said, well, they were, his agent came up to him and was like, Tony the dog? And he was like, Rawr. well, you're in a new movie. Rawr, 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 rawr. What movie? Well, it's called Roborex. <laughs> he was depressed from you that moment You do a disturbingly on. good dog impersonation. Oh, it's almost as good as my flipper. Okay, so let's get back to the film. So He was eating he, breakfast. He was eating breakfast, and this is so great. His dog just looks at him so depressed, and his reaction to this is just put the cereal box over to block the dog's depressed face. And I love the sound editing where you just hear the dog just go, when he moves the box, you just hear the dog go, <laughs> he understands what the kid's doing and then he moves over so the kid can see him more and the kid is just like blocks him again and then he starts giggling to himself the kid like hey, hey, take that dog I'm like this kid does not like his dog at all and his this dog kid is... does not understand object permanence <laughs> but Ryan it says man's best friend on the cover but he's not a man he's a boy ah that's cool man. ah then they cut to him playing with his dog outside, like, oh, they're, they're best friends. But the dog, honestly, I've never seen a dog look depressed having to fetch a frisbee. <laughs> he just looks so fucking miserable, this poor dog. And then the kid misses the bus because he's an idiot playing with his dog before having to catch the bus. And he's like, this is not the first time, James. And the dad has to drive him to school. And of course, it's a typical setup, isn't it, guys? He's the precocious boy genius who's alone. His mum is dead. He doesn't have any friends. There's a bully character who I thought was going to be more prominent in the movie, but he, he was. Isn't. He had two scenes. There's a bully character who wears a camo shirt and says, Hey, look, my dudes. He has a girl thing around his neck. And then another character said, What's that? And he said, A necklace. Fucking great dialogue right there. And then we get introduced to the... Uh, Favourite character of the movie for Lachlan. <laughs> what? In the cafeteria scene. Oh, you're being sarcastic. <laughs> Tell us in the cafeteria scene who we get introduced well, to. Well, beforehand, I, I just want to mention an excellent theory I, I think Eva Bartek or Ryan made. It's just sort of like a about how sort of Doctor Apocalypse, it's like the time-travelling... Uh, Berlin, how, is, how it would have been much better if he'd been the bully grown up. Yes, but, I said yeah. that. But anyway, um, there's this uh, character, uh, the boy's age, uh, Kara, who... Uh, oh, good, you remembered her name, sees, I forgot. Sees, <laughs> I remembered. Sees him being bullied and decides to come up, and the bully's like, yeah, yeah, what, what, what you gonna do? What you gonna do against all of us? And he's like, do it all, I'll tell everyone you sleep with your teddy wetty at night. And he's like, oh, that's impossible, no one will believe you. And she brings up photos of him. Physical photos, not in, like on her phone or anything. In his house... In his pajamas. In pajamas, just going into the ca- fridge with a teddy bear, and it's like, how did you get this? And it's like, that's a secret. And then and it's like, <laughs> how did... <laughs> and then he tries to take him, and she goes, oh, don't worry, I have copies. Or should I say, oh, don't worry, I have copies! Because <laughs> she has the world's highest voice. The voice didn't bother me so much as, like, why, what was she doing in his house in the first place? She one day realized after trying to be a magician, she didn't want to do that no more and wanted to become a journalist. We only find that in, out in the last five minutes. What bothered me a bit was it's like it's like the script kept making her do that sort of like an action movies love interest style quippy flirty thing. 
but she's the... like 11 years old. Yeah, it's a it's a bit weird for her to do the quippy flirty thing. It was incredibly uncomfortable at times. Well, how just, weirdly? Was that just how, me? No, I felt some weird kind of sexual underpinning to the whole thing because it is kind of like. This would work if she was Kathleen Turner with Michael Douglas in the jungle, but this is like, she's 11 years old, like a bead bracelet on, and like, gel pens, and it's just, ugh. You lead a crazy life, James Miller. (laughs) But I like it. Kara's the kind of character who would have a wallet with things in it. Like, you know, sometimes some kids have wallets, but there's, like, nothing in there. Like, they're just like, I just want to have a wallet, because I like Velcro. Yeah. <laughs> She's got a character who would have a wallet with an actual, like, ID and, like, money. Like, money leads and addresses and stuff. Money, yeah, leads to investigations. So we cut away from, we go from the school, and there's a few other things, but the main important thing to focus on is our lead character sees something falling out of the sky, a big, weird, meteorite-looking object in the daytime. And he immediately knows where it is. Well, he follows it. He sees this giant meteor thing falling from the sky. He grabs his best friend, Rex, who he draws pictures of in his book, and they indicate that... Indicating that he's a great artist, in does that fact... In addition to an inventor. In, uh, yeah, in addition to his boy genius, he's also an artist. Does the art factor of his personality ever come into play? No. No, but one of the drawings that was of, like, a time machine... Yeah, well, it did... Was it, Bartek? Are you sure? Did he not write time travel, not in big enough letters? Yeah, on the very <laughs> right-hand side of the page. So he follows this meteorite crash, but To it's... the abandoned warehouse district. Oh, you know, I love how in movies there's always that district. You know, like, there's always that red abandoned construction yard warehouse area where things just are, and kids always go there on their how, bikes. How did he even get in... Side there. Well, just... you know, it was I'm... a very open area. It was wasn't a... it? well, yeah, exactly. It's very open. So we see the meteorite crash, but it's not a meteorite, is it, guys? No, it's a big, like, egg-shaped metal thing. A robot egg. Yeah. And does something hatch from the robot egg? Ah, uh, well, the lid kind of just falls off, and mm. something comes out of it. Destructo cat. Bartek's favorite character of the movie. <laughs> Bartek, tell us about this sequence and Destructo Cat. So while we were watching this sequence, Destructo Cat poked its head out of the egg. We don't know it's called Destructo Cat yet. Uh, a quadruped animalistic metal creature comes out, and it's pretty small. Yeah, it's I, really small. I immediately noticed this isn't the thing from the cover. Yeah. But I think you, Ryan... I didn't I didn't see enough of it to not register it wasn't a dog. I thought, oh, it's just a weird... Yeah, I thought it was like a Paul... I thought it was a dog too. I thought it was a robot dog, but really small. And I just went, oh, I guess it's... Not... I think what happened was I focused on the fact, oh, it's not big. Yeah, you were saying, oh, it's going to grow bigger later. Oh, I assumed that <laughs> it was going to grow big. For a long period of time, I'm like, when's it going to grow big? But then you were like, I don't even think that's a dog. And I'm like, be, don't be silly. And I remember grabbing the cover and pointing, saying, Robo Rex, and then putting it down. But you were right. It wasn't a dog. It was a cat. Much like the child and the dog in the film, we were watching and wondering, what is this quadruped metal animal thing going to do? And it started making sound waves against the wall. Yeah, and the wall exploded and it then hovered away and flew away. Yeah, it, it like it re- retracted its legs and started flying. <laughs> Which, does it do that a lot? Ryan, I would say <laughs> that it does it a hell of a lot in this film. Out of how many <laughs> not, percentages would you say? Not, not necessarily flying away, but flying around, yes. How much would it would you say in the movie it flies? Like... Ninety percent of the time. Ni- uh, uh, you know what? <laughs> Definitely more than eighty. If maybe not... during some of the fight scenes. So Destructor Cat, it's this villainous thing. We know it's villainous because it's red, 
Uh, it's got red eyes and red lighting on yeah, it. And, and it's it, silver, but with red yeah. features. And, the, and you know that means evil. And you notice in some close-up shots that the silver's a bit more dirty than, like, the Roborex on the cover, who's very clean. Because he's a good boy. And also, Roborex has a bit more of a blue thing going on, whereas... Yeah, yeah and might I add, I just want to say, yes, this movie's taking the approach that dogs are good and cats are bad. And that's just facts, people, from my opinion. Dogs good, cat bad. That's just that's. If movies have taught me anything, cats evil, dogs good boys. Adventures of Roborex is a really good authority on this topic. It's pro dog, anti cat. So the do- the cat just leaves. Like it leaves, and we do learn why it's here. This yeah. Cat, Later on, we learn what's what it deals. Pretty with. short after that, because the scene then kind of concludes with Kara was actually there too, but she just missed what happened, and then we have to hear. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, after Ro- a Destructo Cat leaves, um, our heroes approach the egg, and it has a self-destruct sequence of ten seconds, and then of they which it takes really a- slowly walk away. Remember that Lockler where it's like mm. the egg was destructing, and he he took him to like four seconds to, to be, be like, fair, oh, I should run away. I it guess was quite the overwhelming experience for. I him. mean, I agree. If I saw a robotic egg unleash a robotic cat, I wouldn't know what to do, and I was also not having many and, teeth. And when you hear a very clear voice saying self-destruct in 10, 9, 8, da-da-da, all the way to... That was pretty quick, Bartek. It was more like, yeah. self-destruct in 10, 9... I love... I gotta say this. They weren't doing the Mississippi rule, yeah. Every robot voice, including Roborex and that robot egg, they also have a very depressed voice. <laughs> yeah. Run away! <laughs> yeah, but yeah, the egg explodes and Kara g- comes along, but she's not on a bike, I don't think. I think she just kind of stumbles along like she was hiding behind something. And it feels like the room a little bit where we just had a scene happen literally in front of us, and then a character that wasn't in that scene comes into the scene, and they're like, what happened in this scene? And then the character that was in the scene tells them what happened in the scene that we had already just saw. Like, it's so mind-boggling. Like, it feels like... I can imagine the director just being like, these kids, their attention spans are a little bit small, so I think we should just have the kid explain to the other kid what just happened. Because Rather I don't than they have the other it. kid hit there at the first place. Yeah, exactly. What? what? You think girls should be on the adventures to begin with? No, they gotta come in halfway through. Like, that's how it feels. Like, it just feels like... But it did feel like something Tommy Wiseau would do, but for kids. Like, she walks in, she's like, What happened? He's like, Golly gee, here's what happened. And he's just, like, so pandering. And, you know, even though these two... What a funny story, James. (laughs) (laughs) Even though these two characters only just met this very day... Flesh Rex here. He thinks that. that... <laughs> Should I stop calling him Flesh Rex? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just. Every time you mention him, I think of his depressed face and I start laughing. I know I should laugh at a dog, a dog depression, but I do. Flesh Rex is really into the idea that hey, this is a boy, this is a girl. They should probably get together. <laughs> So how does he express this idea, Ryan? <laughs> he pushes the boy several times at the girl until he invites her over for an unplanned dinner in which they don't organize which it with either of their to parents. Be take out pizza. Well, yeah, well, you remember, Lachlan, how that scene begins? The one where they have takeout pizza? Yeah, they enter through the front door. No. Yeah, oh, yeah, they enter through the front door. They enter through the front door and the dad's just like, I didn't know you had a friend. And then you get... I, honestly, what is this? I, I can't remember. They have a name for it. I bet it's in TV tropes. The name for when you begin a scene by having the end of something being said, you know, where it's like, a, yeah, and I that's know. how I cured cancer. And you're like, come back. Like, no, I want to hear how that scene b- Orphaned started. Orphaned punchline, I think. Orphaned, oh, that's it, yeah. Orphaned punchline. That's how the scene kind of goes, where the dad's just like, and then... He was trick-or-treating, and the guy said to him that his costume looked shit, and my son was not impressed because his dead mum helped make that suit. He was the Wolfman suit. People don't watch the Wolfman because they're not hipsters like me with my Rube Goldberg machine. I I think the punchline was, and the guy said, wait, is that a warthog? No, you should have seen the look on this guy's face. Dad, she doesn't want to hear this story. He gets this puzzled look, and he says, he says, What are you supposed to be? A warthog? (laughs) It was pretty obvious. I was the wolfman. 
No one watches those movies anymore. And I'm just sitting there like, how do you, uh, how bad was that? How bad is a is your Wolfman costume if you mistake it for a warthog? Did it, did, did it have tusks? A, a snout? Like that's what I thought too. And I thought, well, a fucking boy genius kid and his boy and her and his genius mum couldn't figure out how to make a good Wolfman suit. The dad's laughing up a storm, and obviously this tells us that this character has a sense of humor that we can get used to throughout oh, the whole film, right? No, he's very serious. Oh, okay. This little boy's a hipster. He's got a robot dog. He's got a bike. He likes old movies. He's got a Rube Goldberg machine. He's got it all happening. He lives in a two-story house. Yeah. And the uh, next meteorite goes right outside it. Oh, yes, because then we get introduced to Robo Rex. Although, to be fair, finally. that was by design. Well, yes. We get to finally meet Robo Rex because his egg crashes outside the house at night and wakes up everyone in the house, but for some reason the, the dad doesn't want to go outside and look. He wakes up too, but he, he's just like, ah, stay inside, I'm a policeman, I don't want to go look out for danger. Whatever. But they go outside, and it's a nighttime shot, it's re- Flesh Rex and Boy... And just them- there too, no, 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 think, no, right? no, hold on. It's oh, Flesh yes. Rex and I Boy... And they get introduced to Robo Rex, and Robo Rex has a bark that just sounds like an alarm for a clock, basically. And that's not designed like that. They just had really shitty effects on the sound. And he says, "The voice of Robo Rex is literally the voice that you would imagine the but dog Ryan, would have." You just said that he barks. So... Oh well, he talks too because he's a robot dog. Oh, so he switches between talking and barking throughout the film, right? No, no, he just does the bark once or twice throughout the film. Just that's it. Okay. Yep. Fair and enough. A... So you know, Robo Rex is introduced, and he's just like, "Yo, it's me, Robo Rex," and here's the whole situation, man. I'm sent from the future. And then you know, he's like, what? And then, well, the dog, he just opens up his back and a holographic projection of our main character from the future tells him about the storyline. Who here wants to kind of recount what our main hero from the future told him his past self, like the whole gimmick of what's this movie going to be? Who wants well, to take that responsibility? In the future, sort of, um, James becomes this... Uh benevolent sort of a uh, sort of tony stark who sort of completely changes the world with a brand new energy of his inventions and a brand new energy source stemming from that necklace that's a little bauble of glass from his neck that his mother gave him yeah but it turns out um he has a nemesis a doctor apocalypse who want who want who's trying to who sent robocat back in time destructor cat Sorry, destructive cat back in time. <laughs> Thank you. To steal the necklace and bring it back to him so he can rule the future, despite the fact that... um, The timeline would be utterly destroyed yep, because there would be no to necklace yep. to use to make this utopian future and the old version of himself yep. wouldn't exist. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And is Dr. Apocalypse anyone that the family knows by any chance? He's uh, Neelix. He's Neelix. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's, not, he's not the scientist that worked with the mum on the project when she died. Yeah. No, they know him as Neelix from Star Trek Voyager. They're just like, Neelix from Star Trek I, Voyager. I, I and he's just like, meant, don't bring it up. I thought you were talking about the podcast family. I thought, oh, you're talking. <laughs> you're referring to your fan base as the family. And I, you know, oh, that, that's a bit interesting. We don't have a name know, for them. They're listening people. That's it. Yes. You're listening, people, people. Yeah. Um, S- so. He turns out to be a former partner of her mother. They were both looking for this rare energy source, but her mother, um, no, wait, his mother just sort of like decided, you know what? Fuck it. I'm not going to tell him about this mysterious energy source. I'm just going to give it to his, to my son and let, let him just get, play more for glory. Yeah, exactly. And, um, the future version of the character is called Dr. Apocalypse. And um, he's rightfully annoyed. He's rightfully annoyed. Even if he was a bit egocentric, he was rightfully annoyed. Uh, it's one of those times where you go, wait a moment, the villain's got a point here. I kind of, um, it kind of like is one of these things where it's like, if they didn't dick over the villain on purpose the way they did, he wouldn't be a villain, but then you wouldn't have a movie. So, but here's the thing was Kara there for any of this? No, she just walks in after this has happened. Where was she, Ryan? Again? She was just hiding behind some bushes. 
behind or in? Oh, in the bushes. Got some great photos. But then he had a stick he was going to hit her in the face with, and then he didn't, and then she grabbed the stick and went, Really? This is what you were going to use? Ah. It was really weird how, how very conf- confident she was about, Really? You're going to beat me to fucking death with this stick? Please. And obviously because she's always carrying a camera and she's just seen a robot dog, she wants to take a picture of it, right? Well, yeah, of course. <laughs> hey! What did you do to my camera? No pictures, please. We go from just that basic kind of setup. So the setup is bad guy sends cat back into the past to steal this necklace that this boy has. And the dog has been sent by... It's basically Terminator for kids. You know, in which Skynet is Dr. Apocalypse. And <laughs> the Robo Rex is... Kyle Reese and young James as Sarah Connor. You know, it's, it's a basic it's basic setup. And uh, you're forgetting Destructo Cat is the T-800. Oh, is, is the Terminator. It's Schwarzenegger. Yes. Does the Destructo Cat ever talk? It makes noises. It does... It does... It does purr a lot. Yeah. It never... You know, I was very shocked. I was expecting, like, this death... Death-defying shriek noise from it. You know, how cats go that... Like, when yeah. they're fighting, it never did that. And I thought, wow, you could do a cool robot f- effect on that, but it they didn't do it. made something that sounded like a bark. Yeah, but... I thought it sounded like a bark. But... No, no, for the cat we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, I am. Oh. I thought the cat was barking. It was pretty weird. So we basically have this setup, and we move from, you know, the general setup of we've got to fight a ba- we've got to stop a bad guy. But then, well, we have to have the same scene again, but for the bad guy... Where the bad guy's younger self is told by his future self the exact same plot. Yep, the one on the cover. Was it Ethan... Phillips? R- Ethan Phillips. Don't yep. say Ethan Hunt. <laughs> no, I was going with an R sound. <laughs> Ethan Hunt's Mission Impossible, man. So, um, Ethan Phillips is then just told by his future self basically the same premise. But it's funnier because his future self thinks of his past self as an idiot. But then his past self, I thought this was the most brilliant part of the movie. Like, I, I look, this movie is up and down for me. I had some real highs of this, but I thought this was actually a smart idea. And I think Lachlan and I were on the same page with this, and I think, you know, Bartek as well. But at first I said, like, okay, why would he want to give it to his future self when he could just keep it as the yeah. past self and build a whole lifetime of fortunes? Wouldn't that be more interesting? And then the film actually took a different step with the villain in which he was like, I don't, you know what? It's great that this crystal exists, but I'm going to try for a majority of the film to make my own crystal or to use this material and this knowledge that I've been given from my future self for my own means. Like he gets given the knowledge of how to make a time machine, which is fueled by this crystal. And he's like, well, if I have this time machine and I can figure out my own method, I can, you know, have this time machine on my own merit. And that's kind of where I went, you know, this guy's not as bad as they want to make him out to be. He does do a few despicable things in the movie and a few negligent things. But overall, I think he was a character that easily could have been redeemed Mm. if they didn't decide to make him the bad guy in the first place. Like, that's how I felt about this scientist guy. I think he could still be redeemed in, God forbid, a sequel. But after we go from Destructo Cat telling the bad guy what to do, where do we go from there? I can't really remember. It kind of all blurs together. It was either him trying to repair the necklace or the next day at school. That's it. This kid is always trying to repair this necklace that the bully broke. And he tries to repair it like he's a watchmaker with like a magnifying glass and a light and like tweezers and pliers. And I'm like, just use your hands. It was just so annoying. The dog's ringing the bell. Flesh Rex is ringing the bell being like, help me. I'm depressed. I'm the most depressed dog you've ever met. <laughs> it's just so fucking depressed. Oh, yeah. The most horrifying part part of just sort of a Flesh Rex's existence is that despite spending the entire film looking as if he wants to die, it's like his owner sort of transplanted his consciousness into Robo Rex. Yeah. So explicitly so it could be immortal, hence yes. preventing him from ever reaching the sweet release of death. We kind of spent a lot of time in the middle chunk of the movie just basically doing nothing. I don't think there's much that happens. It's a lot of characters just interacting. The dad's upset with the son for being a li- like a, 
uh, a Frankie Muniz type character where they're a liar who's got a big exaggeration thing, but that's never really introduced as a part yeah. of his character. We have the girl just wants to get photos and she just wants to be friends with him. And there's quite a few gags of like, oh, hide the robot dog from people. Hide the robot dog from people, wacky fun. More gags of Rex just looking depressed. But then we have, you know, let's just jump to the main big thing. Cat meets dog. Yeah. And Cat meets dog because we find out dog, Robo Rex, has the ability to transport, but only once when he and then he has to recharge fully again. Yeah. And they meet in the town square, I guess. Yeah, basically there he's at he's at his primary school, elementary school. The bullies come in for his second scene. You he's know. like, "What's that vibrating thing in your bag?" As he's going to hit him, Robo Rex out of nowhere activates this teleporter. Thing. <laughs> I remember we all went, "Oh!" Like we thought he just died. <laughs> he punched he him so hard. Pull he everything out. Of, he can pull anything out of his robotic carcass. Yeah. yeah. And in in that sequence, also there were two shots <sighs> where it cut to like one of the doors that leads outside. Yeah. And both times it cut to that. The focus was never in... The thing that we were meant to be focusing on in, in those shots was never in the first place we'd look. Yeah, it looked like composite shots that they green screen the actors onto, but they were real locations. It was just like the framing of it felt so artificial and weird, and you didn't know where your eye was supposed to yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. Like, in that, in the first time it cuts to it, you know, there are students in the background, and we're like, okay, there's a lot of movement there. And then eventually we realized, oh, Kara is on, like, the very left side of the frame. They cut to, you know, a school bully wants to fight him, but then he gets transported to the city square, and then Destructo Cat hovers in. And let's, let's, let, I just, we've got to say this. Destructo Cat got the biggest laughs throughout the whole movie, because he just, <laughs> every time he enters a frame, he, he flies in really fast, and the CG is so artificial, it just looks <laughs> like, again... It's like when you're a small child and you were playing around with Photoshop or stuff like that and you'd get one thing and make it fly around an image and that's what it looked like with this like sliding destructo, across the frame. Yeah, destructo cat. Every time and every time he would come in he has these big red googly eyes that kind of shoot out back and forth and he purrs and it's just fucking hysterical. Like there's times in which he just kind of you hear like mewing and purring and you see behind the character's shoulder there's like destructo cat hovering next to them and you're like oh shit you, me you mentioned the googly eyes and i was like oh that's not the case and then there's a picture on the back and you're absolutely right they are googly eyes thank you yeah they kept sticking out and i wasn't sure why i think like, they were, they were supposed to be a it. zoom feature but like you know it was so funny he had googly eyes and they just have this epic fight scene in the town square where there are no people there, so thank God no one noticed the epic destruction of buildings and cars and stuff. But I loved, there's this fight sequence between the dog and the cat. But the thing I focused on, personally, was they they stopped for a moment to ha keep having this one little fight sequence in front of this one building that just had in big letters, Office for lease! And then these people's name and a phone number. And I just said halfway through, I'm like, hmm, I really want to lease that office. <laughs> I bet this movie was funded by those people who wanted to lease an office. And also, all that is funny, but then you also consider the fact that these two robotic animals are so tiny. They are little. <laughs> they are little, but of course, you know, Robo Rex defeats the cat and they teleport again even though he was supposed to not be charged but i guess i think they were trying to indicate that he drained the car's battery but it didn't come across very well yeah i had a and i didn't believe in it that strongly but i had a theory because when they after the teleportation they had the conversation like oh i need a charge it cuts to the dad doing something and then eventually cuts back to them like oh did they maybe have like a passage of time there but the daylight still looked the same yeah so, look yeah I'm going to be honest, the middle section of this movie isn't really much to talk about. The The highlight is this fight, there's a fight sequence, there's the bad guy just is having a back and forth with his future version of himself with a pre-recorded message, and then the real highlight, to be honest, is the out-of-nowhere drama scene that made us all feel very kind of awkward because it's just like the dad has a go at the son for being this Frankie Muniz type liar character yes, but because then because the doesn't... teleportation he suddenly left school he never went back so he was vanished 
And that's what the cutaway was. The school yeah, was exactly. calling dead. And then it just doesn't matter, though, because it's just one of these forced drama moments. It's like, can we get the dad not on his side? But yeah. if the son tells him the truth yeah, about the I, robot I, I hate cat... Those. I hate those. Oh, I, I, I hate those, too, because it's just like... I feel like movies often take that view that parents never believe their kids. And I'm like, that's not my parents. My parents believe me a lot more than they didn't. And When you told them about RoboCats? Yeah, but like, it's that thing where it's Hollywood. Like, if you let the kid actually fully explain the situation and let him show the dad the Robo Rex and the future message and all that. You but know, of course Robo- the dad has to be like, you're a liar. How could you do this? I won't talk to you until you stop lying. Until then, you're grounded. If Robo yeah. Rex had been completely drained of power, except for a little bit drained of power yeah. after teleportation, like maybe that could have made sense. But then you could show him the robot dog. But also, yeah, there's but this that, whole thing that, where that the... doesn't mean if there's an actual robot dog, just something that looks like a robot but dog. But Lachlan, that it's, he a, it's a it's a weird robot dog. So you, then, if he said, because the whole argument comes from Dad, you remember this robot cat that I told you about earlier? And the dad's like, Oh, you are a liar. And but the, that's where the humor comes into this because it's dead serious, it makes us feel awkward. But then it, ha- it just dramatic tone shift to random musical montage. <laughs> like the dad drops an envelope yeah. and halfway, and Bartek notices not at the beginning of the shot of him grabbing, but halfway through the shot. <laughs> like he's like... already leaned in and he's like got his hand on the envelope. He's grabbed the envelope. Then the music plays and it feels so awkward. And it's a song that's got nothing to do. It seems like, I guess one of the producer's sons had a song that they just made and was like, can we put my son's song in the movie? And they're like, sure, why not? Yeah, and the music played while it cut to like, you know, the dad, the kids and the The evil villain villain just doing shit. at all. Yeah, and I called it like, oh, I guess this is a montage, but it didn't feel like a montage. I woke up yesterday in the pouring rain. They took my shoes like I was walking in a hurricane. I was headed to the only one I loved. I called you down because there ain't nothing we can rise above. This is a movie that at least its strengths, if we had to attest to them, which is it does have a good first act. It introduces the concept and the world and the characters very well. But it's this second act that's just dead weight and boring and nothing really of worth happens since there's nothing really to discuss other than there's a fight sequence and there's a weird musical montage. That's about it and there's just random, oh, we got to hide the robot dog bullshit. But then we go to the third act and, well, Bartek's favorite character... The cat <laughs> kidnaps the kids and takes them to the bad guy because the bad guys realize, oh, I need that crystal. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, they're in, all of them are in um, James's bedroom. They're having like a conversation. And they're like happy. But then it, out the window, you just see <laughs> Destructor Cat pop up. Now, the thing that made me laugh was in the sequence, you hear them talking and, and very quietly in the background, you hear me. <laughs> <laughs> like a robot and they now. don't hear it at all and then you see it hover up but here's the problem they don't do like slow movements with this it's very quick so <laughs> it doesn't match the slow meow sound like meow like you expect it to slowly hover up but it comes up like it's like a bullet straight up and it just doesn't match it's just so funny but yeah he kidnaps them by gassing them that was just yeah, so funny he blasts while well, he goes through the window he knocks them all out then it like cuts to the dad downstairs running up all of a sudden there's a hole and everyone's gone he didn't hear the sound of the cat meowing the hole and then we just cut to them tied up to a pole in this observatory observatory kind of building like a lab kind of a lab i said observatory because it did have like the dome on top at least it's some kind of bullshit lab and you have evil scientist man and he's just basically at this point like Evil scientist man, but we realized that at no point until the very last scenes in the movie did he ever have a scene with a human being. <laughs> I said he could have filmed his scenes in one day because he didn't have to interact with any humans. But then I said as a joke, like when he does interact with these kids, he'll be like green screen CGI'd <laughs> in. <laughs> I love the idea that Ethan Phillips Neelix is like, I don't work with these kids. I love the idea of that. But uh, Lachlan. The yep. third act was exciting, wasn't it? Explosively exciting. It had some twists and turns. 
No. <laughs> there were explosions, though. <laughs> there were explosions, and the girl did twist her way out of ropes because she always wanted to be a magician. What? How did you? Not many people know this, but I wanted to be a magician all growing up. Until last year, of course, when I decided I was meant to be a journalist instead. I have been reconsidering that occupation as of late. Until I met you, of course. And now I know this is the life for me. Look, if this third act was the tone of the whole movie, I think this would be one of the best movies ever yeah, made. it was very action-packed. Because I thought the film. tone of the third act was very wacky and over-the-top, where she's just like, Yeah, I want to be a magician, but then I decided to be a journalist, and that's why I can escape from ropes! And the dog's using his jetpack, and... They're trying to talk to the bad guy, but he's all like, So what? I don't care if this explodes. I'm bad. But he's not really that bad, but it's just so, so weird. What were what were some of the things that happened? So they get tied up. They escape from being tied up. They do knock out Destructo Cat by just hitting it into a garbage bin. Yes, uh, Kara, like, basically swings... Not, it wasn't a baseball bat, but she swings something and it knocks it into a bin. <laughs> and then it's like, I'm done for now. Yep. Until you need me. Until it explodes the bin and then comes back for them. It explodes when they say, oh no, the building's going to explode. And then it explodes out of the garbage bin and it goes, meow! <laughs> <laughs> and I remember, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff happening and they have to stop the building from exploding. They even get, like, the villain to... Try. Because yeah, he but... realises, shit, this is going to kill everyone. But does it work when he tries to stop it? Nope. Does he help the kids? Um. After he realizes it's not gonna, not explode. After he tried to stop it, I. What happened then? He just runs away he with runs the cat away. and says goodbye, kids. <laughs> and they're like, "Shit, he's gonna leave us to die." But Ryan, Robo Rex and Destructo Cat have a rivalry. Well, yeah, they have a real fight sequence, which was the stuff of legends. It really was like. You know, when I was a kid and I watched Dragon Ball Z or Pokemon even or stuff like that, those kind of unbelievable over-the-top animes and Japanese animated yeah. shows where we they had even... fight sequences in which they punch someone into the sky and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, we didn't really point out that they use a lot of sound blast waves, a lot of, like, time-freezing stuff happening. And, like, when they charge into each other, there are impacts that launch them away from each other. It's just... Look, it is something like this. Now, I don't know what you guys are like when you... What shows you guys watched when you were younger, but there always was something like... I watched Dragon Ball Z and Pokemon and Digimon and all that. I always wondered what they would look like in live action on a level. Like, I was like, how would they do this? And if I was a young kid and I saw Robo Rex and I saw these little fight sequences, they're not spectacular or amazing. They're cheesy and over the... They're cheesy, but they're over the top. They're not wimping out on these. Like, when Robo Rex gets punched into, a, like, a wall, he goes through the wall. But, like, I think it's kind of fun like that. Like, when I was a kid, I've, I kind of was like, what would it be like if you had a Pokemon in live action? How would they do the fights? And, you know, how would they punch? Would they punch Team Rocket into the sky? That kind of thing. And I'm glad that Robo Rex has that childlike wonderment to it where it goes... Kids don't care about if this is realistic or not in this way. We like it to be a little over the top, and I appreciate that with the action. Eventually, I think the, villain, cat. the villain's like, let's go, and the cat's like, well, I have to listen to his orders, so... Yeah, the third actor has all this crazy stuff, but the real highlight of this all is the movie dares to ask the question and then answer the question of, should Flesh Rex fight Destructo Cat? Well, the first question that the film asks is, hey, remember Flesh Rex? Oh, yeah. Well, Flesh Rex was important in the third act because he was helping the dad find where the kids were by yeah. barking at in, the sky. In that second act that we kind of skipped over, he wasn't really present for much. He act. was too depressed. There was a point where I said, hey, guys, remember Fresh Flesh Rex? And... and I was like, he's too depressed to come back. <laughs> but yeah, the movie asks... Hey, do you want to see a fight scene between Flesh Rex <laughs> and Destructo Cat? Yeah. And, and they answer that question by saying, yes, you fucking do. At, it's amazing. Yeah, at some point, the dad is at the police station. He sees a photo of what looks like a robot cat and realizes, oh, my son was right. So he takes Flesh Rex to <laughs> find him. it could have been literally anything. It was just a squiggly blob on a piece of paper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but it doesn't matter because the dad knows that his son's not a liar now for some reason. And I like how the dog leads him there by just barking at the sky. And he goes, it's over there, but it doesn't matter because then the bad guy shoots a big green laser from the building. So the dad could have looked at the sky anyway and went, oh, over there, I guess. Yeah, if, if they waited a few seconds and... 
Flesh Rex didn't even need to point it out. Let's not pussyfoot around. Destructo Cat beats the fuck out of Flesh Rex. <laughs> he just fucking wrecks him. Like, it goes on for a little bit too, but they're intercutting it with what the kids are doing Flesh inside. Rex. Flesh Rex, he gets decimated okay. by Destructo Cat. You remember this? Yep. Lachlan kind of missed it for a moment there, and we re- we had to rewind it because I totally was totally worth it. I was crying with laughter. Yeah, I, I, I was on the ground almost with laughter. With I, I this approved, moment, I approved of the rewind because I actually wanted to see it again because I thought I missed something. Like, wait, what? I so what happened? I is still don't really understand. Destructo what Cat happened. fighting Flesh Rex, and then decides I'm going to use my audio sonic blast on the dog, on the Flesh Rex. Yeah, and that while like... we're in the air, and it just the visual image of seeing a robotic cat fucking mushroom cloud blast a living dog across a field into a wall. Is one of the best images I've ever seen in my life. I love it so much. The filmmakers decide the bold choice of killing the dog. <laughs> it doesn't die straight away, though. So the conflict of the film is over, and now we're left with dog dying. So the film doesn't end with just like on that sad note of killing the dog it it goes on a little bit because I'm sorry yes the that's dad right. and the family are like shit destructo cat's still around yeah. we better hide behind this wall do you remember this where the dog yeah. they didn't sedate the dog or do anything they're just like to the dog actor just play dead like look like he's playing dead but when the dad runs over to him he wants to get up because yeah, the, he thinks he's getting a pat there are times where the dog just like lifts its head to look at something people come near him and he's like oh what's up I'm having fun but then the dad I love this the dad puts his hand on the dog's head and pushes it on the <laughs> ground to make it look like he's dead <laughs> and it's just so funny to see scenes of the dad trying to get this cat and in the background you just see this dog laying there on the ground as if it's dead. Yep. And th- it's and just it- great. And throughout this part there is there's this whole thing of like Robo Rex bringing up um you know this is a thing that I can do I can sacrifice myself to defeat to to be fair the dog wasn't supposed to be dead just mortally wounded. But Although it was that dying. Still doesn't understand well, that still doesn't explain why I was just like no, no, don't get up, don't get up. <laughs> it's it's supposed yeah. to be like, you're so injured that you're dying, yeah. you're bleeding out. That, that's a good point. They do go up to it later and it's still living. Um, oh, yeah. But but the thing that I was saying was, um, you know, Roborex is bringing up this plan. I'm going to sacrifice myself to, you know, finally put down the Destructo Cat. And throughout this entire sequence, the frame is such that you can still see the dog just lying there. And then the kid grabs the fidget spinner that's inside of Robo... We didn't Robo even bring Rex. that up. Roborex brings up earlier that he has, like, a, des- a device that looks exactly like a fidget spinner it's that you cover, can yeah. use on yourself to see things. But then he realizes, oh, yeah, you can use that to put, like, my consciousness into the cat, and that will destroy both of us, though. And the kid's like, no, that's sad, but I guess we got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you hear the sirens coming in the background because the police are on their way and the ambulance is on the way. And he does it and Roborex dies and the cat dies. And then <laughs> the paramedics come over and they're like, what's going on? And the dad's like, over here, over here. And you're like, who's injured? I don't remember. And then he leads them over to Flesh Rex and he's like, help him. <laughs> paramedic is just like coming down like putting down their like bag and whatever and I was like on the ground laughing crying with laughter and Lachlan you were like what's so funny and I'm just like well there's a multitude of things and as I said that they're like he's dead and then they put a blanket over the dog well before that the fidget spinner <laughs> stuff happens oh yes the kid comes up with the brilliant idea of maybe I could put Flesh Rex's consciousness into Robo Rex now. And I was laughing because the idea of that shooting day must have been great, where there's this poor dog who already looks depressed, <laughs> having to be forced to lay down for hours on end. Good boy. Good you boy. Good still boy. boy you have to be still and then there's like a precocious little brat kid sticks a fidget spinner on his fucking face and then like and then they're like the dog's dead put a blanket over him i was just laughing my ass off because this is like such a weirdly dark idea for a movie where they're like 
the idea that, for one, the paramedic would have to do something for the dog, they're not vets. Like, yeah. paramedics aren't vets. Like, vets can help humans with medical stuff because they have to study medicine first and then animal stuff second, but it's not like a paramedic would know how to treat dogs with whatever injuries this dog had, which was, like, I guess, ruptured everything from being smashed into a wall. But I love the fact that they just put... They literally have the shot of the dog having the blanket put over them like they're dead. It was great. And then the kid's like, well, I got my robot dog now, who's doing jumps and tricks and barking. But as they're panning out of that beautiful shot, you see just the dog with underneath the blanket, like... It's still, and I'm just like, this is a weirdly happy but morbid shot. Yeah, it's not necessarily that the dog's been brought back to life. It's more like before it died, there was like a copy, and then they put it onto the robot dog paste. And the film kind of just ends on a very pleasant note of being like, some time later has happened, and the dad and the son are very happy, and they've got Robo Rex, and he's you know, playing fetch and he's jumping incredibly high and the dad as an actor wasn't told how high he was jumping so he's looking <laughs> at, the, at the wrong height and saying, wow, that's impressive, like 15 <laughs> seconds after the dog's already landed on the ground. <laughs> and, and then Kara walks in and she's got uh, Destructo, Destructo Cat, cat who's still blasting audio beams, I guess. <laughs> and then the son goes, oh, looks like he's glitching again. And I'm like, Whoa, because he he destroys like a picture of juice or whatever. And then the movie has the weird kind of thing in which he fixes it. Oh my god, I forgot this. He fixes the Destructo Cat, and Destructo Cat reverses the effect of the destruction that it made. So it kind of indicates does he have time beam powers? it's, It's like he reversed time for this very specific. Thing. Area like the, yeah, like the, it's he a reverse beam. time a few other times, like during in the fight scene in the city he, center. He did. He froze there were, time. Yeah, but, there were some time powers. So, but the the indication of wait a moment, if he has time powers, does that mean he has a crystal inside of him to use time? Because in the movie they said that you can't use time unless you have this power crystal. So why did the bad guy need the power crystal in the first place if his cat already had the power crystal? These are the things I ask myself. And the things that the kids who watch the film ask the director. Oh, yeah, of course. And the film ends with the, well, we're going to save mum next. Throw Frisbee up in the air towards the camera and Robo Rex just jumps end film. What was the line that was said before the dad threw the Frisbee? It was like, we're going to have another adventure or oh, something? Oh, yeah. It was, now I know my mom left me the code, not just so I would keep it safe, but so I could use it as a map back to her. Like I said changed my life forever the adventure has only just begun we have no idea we had no real history with this movie but having to watch the movie we had to gauge when this movie came out now i already know when the movie came out i found out i i made sure to look at what year the movie came out but before having to do that i looked at the cover and i kind of looked at how the back images and what the still images were of the movie. And I kind of had a rough guess that this movie for me personally would have come out maybe 2010, Mm. 2011, maybe. And, um, after, you know, even though I knew the year, even after watching the movie, I kind of went, you know, could be around that time. But, uh, what about you guys? What, what year would you say this movie would have come out? For me personally, I was thinking, like, it's got sort of a 2000 sensibility to it. Yeah. But I feel like maybe in this decade, some more studios might have access to 3D, like, animated technology, even though, even if they're not necessarily good at using it. Yeah. So I'm definitely thinking around the same as what you were saying, like, the 2011, maybe 2012. So, 2011 or 12. Give me a year. Uh, you know, you said, you, you were thinking 11, ten. I'll go, uh, I said 10. Maybe. Okay, well, I'll go with, I'll go with 12, 2012. Lachlan, what about you? When you saw this movie and after seeing it, what kind of, what year did you think? It reminds me of the Ace Lightning's series. And I love that similar, show. I, I wasn't, I don't think, small me wasn't that big a fan. And other, and other such shows that used to air on ABC roller coasters back mm. when I was, uh, going to school in um, Nurat, so I think it's from 2005. 2005? 2010 and 2012? Answer! 2014! 
Oh. This movie is quite recent. Wow. We were at university when this movie came out. Yeah, we were finishing oh. off our first degrees. That is amazing. I was shocked when I saw that. I went, wow, wow. And then, you know, I knew before watching, we physically watched the movie. And even, to be honest, even after watching the movie, I was surprised. Also on a level, because I knew one of the actors, Ethan Phillips, from being Neelix. And Mm-mm. he's aged very well. You know, I, I looked at him and went, he's always kind of looked like an old man outside of the alien makeup. He looks like, like I, my Uncle David. You said that continue. You said that a lot. Then we made yeah, jokes it was like, "Oh, freaky. Uncle David's getting arrested for time travel crimes." <laughs> <laughs> Should have stuck with accounting. With Adventures of Robo Rex, would we recommend this movie? Was this a movie that we would say yes? This was something, or no, not at all. But for people like us who are maybe looking for something that, like. You know, you pick this out and you're like, oh, this looks like it might be a little bit, you know, a little bit shit. Maybe there'll be some funny stuff there. We had some pretty good laughs with it. Yeah, the, de- the depressed dog and killing of the dog mainly were mine. And you love Destructo Cat. Yeah, the action in this one was very funny. I, I would... It, I, I don't think I'd recommend it to, like, you know, grown-ups that are much older than us. It's like, oh, you know, this is actually a really good film, really good story and all that. If you want to see something goofy, but still not really, like, awful, I think that this is worth checking out. Just, you know, it's a good time. Watch it with friends. What about you, Lachlan? Would you recommend this? I would recommend watching it if you have someone like Ryan with you, sort of like um, watching sort of uh, bad movies with Ryan. It's like they immediately become enjoyable, so... So if, if if you know someone like Ryan Solinsky, yes, I would recommend giving this a watch. Otherwise, steer clear at all costs, especially if you don't like movies that are almost entirely blue-tinted. Yes, that's true. This movie has such an incredibly blue tint to it. I say yes. I recommend this. And it is a slightly good bad time, but it is not the it's not level of the room, even though it does have some qualities <laughs> of it. But I say yes, this was an enjoyable time. I didn't suffer through this. I actually thought this was a well made movie for an incredibly low budget and what it was trying to achieve being a kid's movie, I think it is good. Like, when I grew up, my parents would buy DVDs that they would just find and go, yes, and a lot of those DVDs were either good or bad. And there was always these kind of DVDs in which they're the straight-to-video, straight-to-DVD kids' movies, and a lot of them are incredibly terrible, incredibly cheap, and not even really for kids. Yeah, we kind of poke fun of them at, in unappreciated masterpieces sometimes. Exactly. And I feel like this one, you know what, if if an auntie bought this for her nephew, her eight-year-old nephew for his birthday... It would be a decent gift. I apologize for my adult-centric recommendation. I do think that this is fine for kids. I think this is very fine for kids. And as an adult, oh. I, I personally enjoyed it because I recognized a certain actor. I thought it was just very funny how depressed the dog was. When he kept coming on the screen, Flesh Rex, I just kept seeing it turn in my brain. It just desaturated and just, Hello, darkness, my old friend. <laughs> just come up <laughs> in my brain. It was just so funny. And then just seeing the dog actually get decimated like Goku style at the end was amazing. So yes, I would recommend. We're nearing the end of the show, but unfortunately, as is tradition on our show, are we in The danger? Mystery Box, we are, we are in danger. We cannot escape the episode or the room because we are in fact trapped in the room in the room because of time paradoxes every time we try and open the room it's we're entering the room again oh, shit. there's a time field around us from the evil doctor okay. apocalypse we can't escape this room Unless we have four people with four unique skills. And there's only three of us. We need to pick a fourth person that's from the movie. Thing or person. We have to nominate someone. And who we come up with together as a group, who we agree on as a group, will be the one who will help us. But we'll first nominate a a thing or a person from the movie. I'll go first. I say if we were in danger and we needed someone to help us out that was from the movie i would definitely say that we should get flesh rex to help us out his sad demeanor but willingness to help 
really would be something that we need right now. Because I feel like we're all incredibly happy, but I feel like we need that Eeyore of the group to just bring us down to the real world. And I feel like Flesh Rex is that guy. Bartek? Well, considering that we're having a time paradox, it almost seems like the logical thing to do would be to pick the one that has the time powers. Yeah. Yes. Which that would be... Destructo cat. Of course you're going to nominate the cat. I mean, you kind of set it up. Oh, yeah, 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 so. yeah. Oh, I completely understand. Uh, Lachlan, you're going to say Destructo cat as well, I imagine? Or do you have someone... Well, at first I was quite tempted to say Doctor Apocalypse, because on the measure of it... <laughs> future he, him or past him? Both, both seem interesting. Like, f- future him probably, because, I mean, he was smart enough to invent time travel without the magical power source. So that is true. That implies that he's the most intelligent person in that u- universe. Um, then I thought, like, possibly, may- possibly maybe fu- future James would m- might might be the best in terms of, uh, of uh, raw competence, but I-, I-, I get the sort of feeling that if you sort of pricked him with the pin, he might sort of explode. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like I'm um, like like one of those characters about as light as a as a, as a soap bubble. So <laughs> so either so either Robo Rex or future Doctor Apocalypse. It is got to be Destructo Cat for the pure time elements. But you know, just to defend Flesh Rex. Did you see him die though? That was pretty impressive. But okay, so With his dying powers. We could he's surely... much tougher than an ordinary Labrador. That's he so he did survive a Goku like punch. So we are nominating Destructo Cat because he does have time altering abilities. But first, we all need to have our method of trying to solve the situation. So Bartek, what are some things that we do? We can run a try and run away. We can do an attack move special. Well, Ryan, because we all have to do something before Destructo Cat, I feel like he's going to be our trump card, but we all have to, you know, do try. something. We, uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to leave the room by, yeah. I assume, opening the door and walking out of it. Yeah. We have to try maybe thinking outside the box. The room, perhaps. So if you would all stand back, I think well, I'll, my way of going outside the box would be to close the door and try to squeeze through the gaps of the door. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to just try to do that for a while. Okay. And if you need to open the door, let me know. I'll stop and you can okay. do your thing. Now, Lachlan, we're trapped in a time-shielded room. Yep. What yep. kind of method to get out of the room or to attack this would you choose? Well, either I'd try sort of uh, chipping my way through the walls or ceiling... Uh-huh. Or, like, I'd use my ability to sort of uh, state obvious solutions, and I'd tell sort of like Do- Dr. Uh, apocalypse? Dr. Future Apocalypse, or Destructo Cat, or whoever we've got in. It's like, um, like instead, instead of sending the robot back in time to do some incredibly elaborate plan, just get us to stop going into the room in the first place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and just just cut to the chase, like, no bizarre plans, just... Kill us. <laughs> not kill us, just stop us from entering a room. Stop us from doing the episode. <laughs> we might be a bit sceptical, but, you know, RoboCat, that does quite a bit to uh, diminish uh, scepticism. If you're listening to this episode and it's been released, then... We, know we did, we managed. <laughs> yeah. So, Lachlan and I are very on similar pages. So I was going to use sheer logic as well as my attack move, which was... I open up the door. Bartek, you're like, do you want me out of the way? I'm like, no, no, Bartek, I'm just opening the door. Actually, I, I succeeded. I'm already home. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm opening up the door, and I just look out the door, and I just say, time's a construct. And I proceed to walk out, and I'm trapped in the in-between zone of our time and the time outside. So I failed in my move. I am trapped in the in-between of time. Bartek, what do you think Destructo Cat's going to do to help us? Well, Ryan, Destructo Cat has many modes. When it comes to movement, he's floating. Or flying, <laughs> rather. <laughs> yes, he is. He starts flying. He flies out of the room. Mm. And he doesn't come back into the room. No. That's odd. All of a sudden, the window in the room smashes and he comes in. And he re- he realizes he communicates to us what what the deal is. The deal. 
Yes, but we can't understand him because he just makes noises. He's purring, yeah. So what he does is he he goes, like, below all of us. He, like, motions us to stand in front of the doorway. Uh-huh. And he does the big blast wave. <gasps> and we all go flying out of the room and into... We're outside of the field. It turns uh. out, Ryan, we weren't... The outside of the box logic that we were meant to follow was we weren't meant to walk out of the room. We were meant to be launched out of the room. Classic... Classic, classic. That's exactly how we survived this episode. And you survived the episode too by very, getting to this point. Very abstract it was battle ve- this time. Well, Roborex was a very abstract time movie. <laughs> you guys have been fantastic. Very cerebral. Oh, very cerebral. Lachlan, it was a pleasure to have you Thank join you, us Ryan. for the mystery box Thank and you, talk Bartek. about the wonderment oh, of I had fun. cinema. I had fun. As always, you guys listening have been fantastic, amazing, wonderful listening people. Bartek, a pleasure as always to be co-hosting with you as we travel through the twisted, murky, dark realm that the box of mysteries presents to us with each movie we have to watch. Luckily, this time, we enjoyed it. It's been two movies in a row that I could say were movies. So, until next time, remember... To be kind to each other. Kind like Destructo Cat.